to David Bieber's tonight. This is Julie Week. It is that song. Um, so for those for whom it's the first time that you come, um, if you have any sub question or anything in your mind that you would like some clarity about or any issue that you're dealing with and you would like to look deeper and and be clear, that's really the opportunity of the satsang. To just bring up everything and, and to let the spirit just um, help to see through it and to let it go. Yeah, it's the best thing to do with your arm. To help you just... When you leave tonight, just be buzzing with happiness and joy and high energy and feeling so connected to everyone and everything and to share with you the, the joys that we're experiencing and really that everything is perfect and you're so perfectly taken care of and you know, it's fun to talk about divine order that all things are working together for good, that things really couldn't be any different than they are. It's, it takes a lot of surrender, but it's well worth surrendering into grace, because you feel wonderful in grace, then it's your birthright to feel that. So I just recently was, you know, Lisa, she was inviting me to her quantum awakening retreat, wanting me to speak in quantum terms. So. Yeah, just for that invitation, I start, oh, I start getting all kinds of <laughs> quantum ideas. Sometimes it comes out in spiritual ease, or sometimes it comes out in psychology and contemporary terms, and then sometimes it wants to come out in quantum. And so I'm feeling quantum tonight. <laughs> we just watched a two-hour and 35-minute quantum movie. <laughs> quantum relationship movie. I love it when you put those two together. Quantum mm -hmm. relationship. Because a lot of our memories that are so important to us are around relationships. We can think back in our life and quickly think of important key relationships and key moments and key turning points. They flood right in instead of trying to remember what was the, the weather on October 4th, 1972. We remember the relationships, those memories, and yeah, the word that came to me that just started coming to me, I think it was mentioned in the movie, and it just triggered it tonight for me too, was entropy. Entropy. Um, so if any of you know anything about science, that's one of the kind of the things that they've discovered about the cosmos and the linear time space universe is entropy that everything in linear time is moving towards chaos mm. everything absolutely everything so you can equate linear time the arrow of time with chaos it's their synonyms so that's a good place to start. It's very reassuring. It is. You, know, you cannot fail if it ends up in chaos. That's fine. That's how yeah. it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's true. It's, it, it kind of gives you a baseline. You know, I always like to, I feel like truth is so glorious, but it loves, it can use and incorporate science and psychology and philosophy and, and everything, cooking. It can incorporate everything and use it, mm -hmm. use the metaphor. Buddhism uses a lot of metaphors from nature, beautiful metaphors. It can just incorporate them. But the other thing, not only is linear time moving towards chaos, but one thing we know about linear time and time-space is that it's finite. And that is juxtaposed or in contrast to eternity. If we call eternity, the eternal, the forever, the everlasting as reality, like God, or oneness, then the finite is, by nature, very different from eternity. It's, you can measure it, you can't measure eternity, you know, and, and you can measure it and it's finite. So, 
So basically what we're looking at in terms of the whole linear construct is it's, it's, it's finite chaos. And, and the movement of time is the movement to this finite chaos. So that gives you more incentive to open up to reality, doesn't it? I mean, you want to be content with finite chaos? Is that... <laughs> Does that sound like something you can settle with? <laughs> Talking about settling for second best, it's really mm, eternity, finite chaos, mm, eternity, <laughs> finite chaos. Mm. But but actually, it, you really have to look at it closely because when you get into regrets of the past, grievances of the past, worries about the future, you're actually choosing finite chaos <laughs> in that moment. You know, it, it really is what it comes down to. You're choosing to identify with finite chaos and get all bent out of shape about this crazy identity. And then the other thing that strikes me out of this, this linear time-space construct is that the personality self, which seems so important, that's why we, we try to self-improvement and ensure it and and educate it, and pamper it, and dress it up, and really work it out, make it fit, work <laughs> on its cholesterol level, you know, do all these things for it, is really just a point or a coordinate in time and space. That's all it is. It's, it's like we talk about all that like we're talking about a molecule. We kind of talk about all that would sound ridiculous. It sounds like a George Carlin monologue of talking about all of that importance for like one molecule and all the personality self is is a coordinate in this finite chaos <laughs> and that's getting pretty insignificant it would be like if you spent your entire life in this seeming lifetime concerned about one molecule that's about how absurd it is to the universe the time space this universe. So, so what we really want to just make clear tonight is that's that's why in spirituality you're interested in forgiveness. That's why if you read a book like the Course in Miracles, it has lessons like Lesson 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. And Lesson 129, beyond this world is the world I want. Because Jesus is saying, beyond this finite chaos, there is a world that you want. It's a forgiven world. It's a happy dream. It'll take you back to eternity. And whether you're consciously aware of it or not, it, it would be very good to even be curious about this happy dream or this forgiven world. It would be great to be curious about divine order. If, if the cosmos is finite chaos, then whoa, how do you define divine order in finite chaos? You don't. It's prior to time. Before Abraham was, I am. Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, says it's a priori. It's, it's prior to time and space. If time and space was like a big, long, you know, rectangle, we'll say, then you would find the divine order in the I amness that precedes the chaos. And we think we're going forward in time, but that's a joke, because everything, the past and the future, are already finite. It's already a finite package. You're just seemingly peering out through a, a, a perspective based on preferences and judgments and beliefs, and you're just taking a little peek from inside the finite chaos and looking around going, hmm, so this is life. <laughs> no. It's not. And, and you have to get prior to the finite chaos before you can find the happiness. So really, this is like a call into joy of starting, first of all, to see that you've been completely wrong about everything. And that's what I liked about the movie today, because at the very end, the physicists had said that you know, time, the Big Bang, and time is expanding, but it will reach a point of equilibrium, almost like if you're playing the accordion. You get out to a point, and then that's as far as it goes. And then it will start imploding on itself. 
there'll be the big implosion instead of the big bang, the big contraction. And and what that means too is everything that he thought of as linear time will will simply reverse. You know those movies where everything's going backwards. Imagine that life where everything is backwards. Everything. And if you think you might go crazy if it was all backwards, it just means you have to readjust because all of this forward stuff hasn't made any sense anyway. <laughs> Nobody's been any sense. So why would you think it would be more difficult to go backwards? And that was what was so great about the movie. The main character reached that point where he really got it, and then he just started laughing. What was he about 118 years old? Really wrinkly, but really laughing when he got it, and then. He seemed to die, and then he seemed to reverse the death. He, his eyes came back open, and everything went backwards. He went kind of out the corridor, laughing with his arms going like this, and all of his steps backward. Which is just, that's another quantum principle. That it's just as easy to go back in time as it is to go forward. You know, we're so accustomed to thinking that time moves in only one direction. Even though we love Jules Verne and time travel, and like personalities going back in history, we like, oh, that's fascinating. Let's, you know, make movies and stories about that. But we're saying, you know, both of those directions are equally unreal. And the present moment will offer you the escape hatch from the illusion of the finite chaos, backwards or forwards. People always ask me, the world's getting better or the world's getting worse. It's you can't even answer that. It's just finite chaos. I don't usually say that right out bluntly, but <laughs> you know, that's it. now what I love is is taking that, which is quantum physics, and bringing it right down to your practical daily life questions. You know, because you can see what I'm talking about. If you just let your mind go, wow, it has some pretty strong implications. You may start asking yourself, why do anything? You know, why should I be so concerned what my little personality self is doing? Do the right thing, morality, ethics. <laughs> this is kind of a broad context that kind of pops ethics and morality and good and bad in the world. Morality, just like a bubble, like a little soap bubble. Oh, God, that wasn't anything either. But they seem to, the mind seems to be very guilt ridden and it wants to cling on to these soap bubbles and constantly try to hope that it's doing more good things than bad things. So if there is, just in case there is a God, I hope when I get to the gates, the pearly gates, I've got more good things than bad things. Because I don't even want to test what might happen. You know, I don't, I don't want to just sing a happy song. I, I, I really want to know that it's going to be okay. As if God would judge some good, and welcome them back to oneness in heaven and judge some as bad and condemn them to hell. That's dualistic thinking again. That's part of the finite chaos that we're escaping. So, yeah, I think it's fun. And I know you enjoyed the movie today, too. I'm, I'd love to hear what some of your yeah. experiences were with that movie. Yeah, there were two things. The, the main one was for me the idea that we have no choice, which is an idea that we've been talking a lot lately in this community uh, those last days. Um, even the, yeah, the, just, um, just really seeing how everything, like the problem is that we believe we have choice, and that when we realize we don't, actually, and we just go with what is, what is given each and every moment, there's already such a huge release because there is no fighting, there is no thriving for anything, there is no need to try to make anything happen. It's the same idea that David is talking about. Everything works together for good, and everything that I need is always given me. The plan, you know, the plan of awakening, the plan of healing of the spirit is always perfect, and always giving us all the opportunities that we need in order to, to really be free in each and every moment and to realize who we are. And, uh, and to, to forgive everything that we need to forgive in order to come back to this realization. So the main one was that one, actually, just sinking deeper in this idea that we have no choice and seeing how 
it plays out in our life, just every time we need to make a choice, that it brings up the idea of right and wrong, it brings up the duality, because there can be no choice if there are no two things. And so really, if you use this idea and you come back to the very beginning of duality, it just brings you back to realizing that if there is no choice, how can this happen? Which is quite huge, just really accepting that the error never happened, that separation from our source or oneness or God never happened, because there never was a choice. In order for, um, for this whole world to come about, they would need to have choice and the idea that we could separate from what we are, from, from the wholeness that we are, and that we could have decided otherwise than what is. And so this whole idea is just, yeah, an idea that I really love to go deeper into and just play with. And the other one was more experiential for me. There was this little boy who is actually called Mr. Nobody. It's just really awesome. This movie is really awesome. And he's sitting and he's talking as he's a little boy, like, what am I? Like, how can I be sure that I even exist? And, and it's like really seeing that I exist only through the eyes of the others. There needs to be other in order for me to exist and to prove to myself my existence. Because if there is no other, how can I prove anything? How can I prove that I even exist? Because I cannot see myself through my eyes. I can see hands, I can see, you know, the body like that. But I cannot even see my eyes or I cannot see my face except if I look in a mirror or when others look at me, then it seems that, oh yeah, it seems like there's somebody here. But it's like really this experience actually of there is, there is just emptiness. And it just seems that because all those eyes are looking here, it seems like that there is a center of attraction, like something or attention in this moment. But when there isn't that, what am I? How, like, where I, where am I? And it's just this idea of location, which is something that was brought up actually uh, in the movie too, with simultaneity of time and also with choice. The idea, which is quantum, the idea that because we believe we have choice, we can. Um, and, and that we are located, we can choose one experience against another, or more than another, and that will determine our location, when actually everything is happening in the same time, in one moment, in one instant. But we will seem to live only one experience instead of all those hypothetical experiences, because there is the idea of choice. And so where it seems that the choice or attention is given, then it seems that that's where, that's what I am. That's what is defining who I am, what locating me. And it seems that then there is a separation from everything else. So yeah, it was really exciting movie. <laughs> yeah, it like really puffed the mind right up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have, have movies, that, you know, fairy tales and the and the boy and the girl or the man and the woman get together and we have even kind of intricate soulmate movies. Um, what was that one with Jonathan Kuzak and Kate Beckham? Serendipity. That's a soulmate movie, you know, mm -hmm. where you watch all the twists and turns and twists and turns and in the end, you know, I want you to be together. They even have the music in the background. You can. I want you to be together, like the spirits trying to bring the soulmates together, and they go through so much, and then they finally connect, and then uh, the movie ends, and, and they lived happily ever after, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, we know differently, but uh, in this movie we have little uh, little Nemo. Is it Nemo? Nemo? Little Nemo, little boy. He's he's just going down the street and. And there's three girls that are, hi Nemo, hi Nemo, hi Nemo. And it all plays out in a very quantum way that they all are kind of like soulmates. Yeah. And his the triple soulmates. <laughs> Nemo has three soulmates. So. And, and you can't even squeeze it into a lifetime because, yeah, so some of them he has kids with. Did he have kids? 
he had kids with two of them and one of them yeah. had kids and it just kind of intertwines and goes on and on and on. And that's why Nemo, as he goes on in the movie, becomes Mr. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Because he starts to begin to realize that he doesn't even exist as an individual, as a separate person. That's going pretty deep. And, you know, Buddhism talks about, you know, the emptiness, or sometimes people will talk about the nothingness, the still mind, the nothingness. I call it no thingness. It doesn't have things. It's just this merge of energy and oneness and love. But it's that I really enjoyed that too because it wasn't like those were peripheral relationships. I mean, his mother and father starts off with, like for many of us, where he's got a mother and father, and I think they came together because of a leaf that came on, down on the sidewalk. It was wet, and then then. His mother slipped, and the father helped her up, and that's how they show all the nuances, you know, like the butterfly effect. <laughs> the leaf plays a lot in this one. One leaf, and then that leaf comes in again and again and again. It's just this tiny thing, but it's so huge. And then a key point comes when, when his father's watching something on his hand, and, and the car that he got out of rolls along and, and runs over a woman in her baby carriage, mm -hmm. and so he feels this great grief. His whole life is determined by one event, because he takes it on, like he could have done something different. He, like the script wasn't written, and he could have, he should have been more attentive with the car, and, <laughs> and put the brake on, or <laughs> something, you know, before he left the car. He was preoccupied. But what's good is that, that Nemo's parents do decide to split, and then there's the great Train scene. Maybe you can des describe what happens when father and mother are going their separate ways, and Nemo is at the train station. Yeah, he's at the moment of choice. <laughs> and choice. It's, yeah, it seems like he has to choose between his mother or his father, and he starts to run. His, his mother is in the train. He starts to run to catch her and to jump in the train. And at some point, the, the father calls him, and so he stops for a moment. And it seems like that the whole movie plays out with both possibilities. You have one scene, like one scene you see it as if he is with the mother, and the other scene you see as if he is with the father, and how it would have played out differently. And that's how those, those girls from his childhood just are, are also showing up in, a, in those possible lives, as if he could, he could have made a choice and that uh, he, he lived one more than the other. So yeah, it's really, it's really actually mind blowing this movie because it goes in all direction all the time. So it is quite chaotic, <laughs> and it just takes your mind out of figuring out anything. Like really, you have to just let go in order to be able to just be in the movie. And I feel that's really how life is. It's like you cannot figure out anything. You cannot try to do the right thing or try to not do the wrong thing. It's just constant letting go of anything we think we know and to just be very present in the moment and open to what is really, what is given us in each and every moment. Yeah, um, and <laughs> it's like, how, how about being put in a difficult situation where you love your mother and you love your father, one's taking a train, one's calling you back to the station, and you can see it in, in little Nemo's face. Like, this is an impossible choice to make. I love them both. And you can see it in his face. And, and you might say that equates to the, to the Big Bang, to the ego belief that you can separate. When you have that pit in your stomach, when you have that sad feeling, no, 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 this can't be. It can't be that I have to choose between mom and dad. It can't be that there's, I have to make that choice. And eventually he, he reaches a point where he... It's almost like he can't, so he can't even fathom the choice between mom or dad as those two options. So he closes his eyes, and, and then when he opens it, he, there's a pathway that leads away from the, the railroad tracks and the railroad <laughs> station, and he goes right down that road. Oh my God. And this is what imagination is. This is what no. the finite chaos is. When we... When we feel this belief, this, this deep feeling like the fall from grace it's called, or somehow we, we made a wrong turn and 
dropped off from heaven, like we were eternal beings. We had it so good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, a good without opposite, not a good bad. We had it eternally good, and then somehow something seemed to happen, and we felt this. Oh no, this is impossible. And somehow we use this finite, you know, time space cosmos to try to put the pieces back together. Except it never really works out. We've been at this for a millennium trying to get the right pieces, you know. That's what the soulmate quest is about, isn't it? I mean, out of all the, what, seven billion to find one out of the seven billion, like the serendipity movie, you know, find it. And then, then credits roll, music plays, and they live happily ever after. Yeah, but we know how that goes, because we will never be content with a mask. We can never be content being a personality self. In the end, we, we can let the spirit use interpersonal relationships as mirrors, like you were saying, that reflect back to us what's going on in our consciousness. It's, it can all be used. We shouldn't push anything away. But in the end, by the end of this movie, Nemo, who's growing up, he starts to just follow the signs and symbols. He, he scratches on like a quarter, yes on one side, and no on the other, and he'll just flip the quarter with no regard from the past, from past preferences, he just starts flipping the quarter. Or he'll be in the street and he'll see a billboard and a sign, and it will say, Nemo, turn, turn down the street, and he starts to get real direct signs. We would call it guidance. When you get really intuitive and you start to get signs and symbols and people you meet, they tell you, what's well, obvious. You don't have a problem at all. You just need to do this. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for making that so simple for me. You know, and that's what happens in this movie. He really starts to escape the, the whole difficulty, the whole impossible chaos of the world by just simply following his guidance and then surrendering totally into that. Yeah, which is really the path that the Course in Miracles is offering because it's like we're just so wound into this world and we have lives and we have preferences and we have private, private anything, everything actually and, and we don't know how to come out of it. We have no idea what is the path but by tuning in into spirit or, or into our higher self, however you call it, that's the only way to really come out of it, to realize that we've never been in it first, but really we can't know that ourselves. And I feel the course is really, really well done for that because it gives you a map on how to do it. And it's a very practical mm -hmm. application of what, what the Spirit is guiding you to do in each and every moment. And so it feels so important to really transfer that to every area of life and to really make no exception and to really ask for guidance for each and everything that we do so that our life is a devotion to awakening to our, our true self and is just really guided in each and every moment by spirit. And yeah, this movie is really beautiful for that because the chaos, like it goes in all directions all the time and it really is showing that it's impossible to know the way ourselves. But by following the sign and symbols, as they've been saying, then you see that it's happening. You don't even, I didn't even understand how. It's like, you don't, but that's just how it is. It's happening in each and every moment. And not by understanding it or trying to figure out why that or more that or why do I need to do that, but just really by trusting, having such a deep trust in the plan that is given in each and every moment that we can only be at the right place every time. It's impossible that we would be at the wrong place or doing something wrong. It's always perfect each and every moment. It gets right into the topics of free will. It gets right into the topics of destiny. You know, those are big topics in philosophy. You might have seen the Matrix trilogy. You know, the Wachowski brothers launched their first movie and then just when we went, wow, wow, they launched the sequel, and the sequel gets into choice, we're talking about tonight, and free will and illusion, the Frenchman, I mean, they're just, it's the key maker, the architect, 
it just comes, it takes a real deep, good, deep movie that's kind of a, a composite in the first one, and then it just launches deeper into these themes. But uh, there are teachers like Carolyn Mace who talks about before you even come to this world, you have contracts. You know, you there's decisions made at the level of mind, the level of consciousness, that have nothing to do with our day-to-day -day decisions about whether we wear this blouse or these set of trousers, where even whether we marry this person, divorce this person, some of the things we would consider pretty high major decisions, like marital partners and things like that, they're all prearranged, they're like packaged. And you might say if you go deeper and deeper, more than just prearranged for this lifetime, the whole thing is quantum, the whole thing of time and space was spun out in one instant, and Jesus calls it in His Course in Miracles, the unholy instant. I mean, if you're trying to run away from God, what else could it be but unholy? <laughs> and when you turn back to forgive, and say, I was wrong, I was wrong about all of it, that's the holy instant. You drop back into your pure innocence of seeing you could have never made any of those mistakes, including the drop <laughs> from heaven. That was, a, that was an illusory mistake too. Pure innocence is what I think it's all about. That's why I liked at the end the main character. He was just smiling and laughing and happy. And he said, if this is the most beautiful day of my life, right before his eyes closed to seemingly die, uh, that's a beautiful, those are words that's great coming out of your mouth as you're ready to take your last breath. This is the most beautiful day of my life. And he's 180. 18 years old, he had to come to a realization to, to authentically say, this is the most beautiful day of my life. And that's where this thing of destiny comes in. It's like, we don't really have free will as we think of it in terms of choice. Most of the times people think of free will and choice as synonymous. Our free will is for perfect happiness. That's why God created us with free will, because God gave us perfect happiness and a free will, but not the kind of will that can choose among illusions and trying to be happy. He's talking about just the state of being. It doesn't have anything to do with choice. So first we got to disconnect choice away from free will, and then we have to see that everything that we perceive is all destined. Not just one script we call a lifetime, but all the scripts. And I love these movies that start to bring them all in. This one was jumping all over the place. It reminded me a, a little bit of what was the Wachowski's recent one that they did? The Cloud oh, Atlas. 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 Yeah, it, it reminded me because I know I've gone with people to see Cloud Atlas and they're like, you know, like, I loved all the characters and the costumes. <laughs> they're like, what? 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 You know, it's like, what do you got? Seven lifetimes going on here at one time? It's yeah. like kind of hard to follow. But that, when I was going to see that movie in the theater, that was the time when Frances started off in, with me and Camus, and, and all day long she just kept shaking her head and saying to me, I don't know who I am, I don't know who I am, <laughs> really it's disturbing, I don't know who I am, I don't know, so I said, well just get in the car with me, we, we drove all the way to Cloud Atlas, she was like, I don't know who I am, I don't know who I am, it's weird, I don't know who I am, it's disturbing, <laughs> and then I said, well, just Let's just let the movie give you the answer to the, the dilemma. Just, have, just relax, put this question aside for a moment, and let's just go see it. And then, yeah, as we got, it was like a meditation, and then we got to like the final five minutes of Cloud Atlas, and she just burst into tears, and she was sobbing. She fell over on my lap, and tears all over my pants, and just all this crying, crying, crying with this huge soaring experience, like light, wonderful experience. Oh. And that's the way we kind of approach truth. We, we approach it through negation. We see everything that we're not. Mm -hmm. And we have to see it in the most obvious way. Because, you know, if someone says, you're, you're not the body, oh, well, it sure <laughs> seems. <laughs> God had a lot of experiences that showed me that I am. You're just telling me this intellectually, it sounds pretty good. You're a spirit, you're not a body. Well, okay. But I mean, we need an actual experience that transcends the body to really a full blown mystical experience that really gets us going on the spiritual path. 
Otherwise, we're kind of, oh, sentimentally, that sounds good. I'm the eternal spirit, and I'm not a finite being, and, you know, uh, okay, I read it, I read it in the scripture. It sounds pretty good. But it has to be a full-blown experience, a mystical experience, before we go, ah! <laughs> you know, you really have to get it, have that experience, even if you just get a glimpse of it. It's it changes everything in your awareness. It, it's a, it's like a purifying light that just boom explodes in your mind, and that's really what this is for. That's what satsang is. It's, it's, it's knowing that presence as an experience, not as an intellectual idea or as a hopeful, maybe in the future if I do enough practice, sometime <laughs> off in this imaginary future, the ego's like, ah, ah, ah. keep thinking that, ah, ah. because it's, it's not that at all. So we're all, this is the Nemo night to, to take the journey. And the message, I even, it was just a wonderful experience for me, but also the, one of the three girls was, it was a character, it was one, was it that, the last word that he Anna. spoke before he died? He just said, Anna. And halfway through the movie, our TV screen totally went to black. <laughs> we were like watching all this, and then you could just hear words, but it totally went black, so we had to take a break. And then I went upstairs and I was making some calls and this and this and while I was on my bed, Jason came in while they were getting the second half of the movie ready and he came in and he said, oh look, a special delivery letter, airmail, found me here in Hawaii from Anna. <laughs> oh, I like it. And the universe does that. <laughs> the movie, she was like, it was really central and then the letter. Uh, and then when I opened it up, it was a three-dimensional, the kind of your car, and these, it was a big hug coming out. <laughs> it came right at me, this three-dimensional hug, a hugging card, it's like these big ostracized. And so I was like, oh. So it was, you know, and that's what you want. You, you want it to be mystical, and you want it to relate to you so perfectly that you can't miss it. Mm. Like the universe is calling your name and saying, here, this is for you. You're the entirety of everything. You are limitless. You are boundless. You are pure spirit. And I'm sending a message <laughs> to you that you'll be able to smile and almost wink and go, thank you. Thank you. That's what true spirituality is about. Not some high ideas or ideals that sentimentally seem like they might be true. You know, that's, you could just study theology for years and just get those, oh, sentimentally, that sounds good. Reincarnation, yeah, that kind of sounds helpful. But, you know, your heart's not bursting open with it, it's just like, Somewhat satisfying. Okay, we all make it back to God eventually. Okay. <laughs> we could just work on that eventually part, then that would be good. <laughs> experience like that today. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know, maybe it was a week ago or I went into, uh, I had a doctor's appointment and I was going to get some a prescription refill. And I went in and the woman looked at me and said, you don't have any health insurance? I said, no. And uh, she said, do you have social security? I said, well, I just turned 65, but I don't have any anything to help with this prescription or anything. I said, you need to talk to Anna. She's wonderful. She's right around the corner. It sounded like Anna, but I'm not quite sure. About that. And I, so go around there and talk with her. So I, okay, I mean, it was just such a cheerful 
and direct <laughs> thing. So I went around and talked to her, and she said, what's your situation? I explained it, and I, not with any real hope, you know, because I thought, I, I didn't even fill out papers back then. And she said, you need to talk to Julie. In fact, I'm going to have Julie call you. And so she gave me this number. So yesterday, <coughs> and I was sitting in the movie theater, and my phone rang, and I'm horrified, so I turned it off. But then when I came out of the theater, I called back, and it was Julie. And she said, oh, well, can we meet tomorrow? And I said, well, uh, I don't know. Where are you? I don't know if I can get the deal over. She said, no, no, I'll come to your house. And uh, she came here. <laughs> Kate with this afternoon. <laughs> and she just did everything for me. She got me all signed up for stuff. And uh, while she was doing it, she said, Well, we'll have to call Social Security and Medicare. And uh, she said, You know, oftentimes there's a wait. And I, I had tried earlier, and it was an hour wait. And so she called up, and the, the tape said, It's an hour and a half wait. And she said, Well, let's get through. And she went right through. She was the next call, and there must be, you know, I don't know. She said she always does that. I mean, just like you know, an angel. Pay no attention to the words on the machine. Just transcended bureaucracy. It's been incredible. You know. so, Your angels. Yeah. Very much like Nemo, just one clear step. Well, to the next, to the next. I point. had no choice. I mean, everything was such. <laughs> I don't believe it. That's great. I had no choice. Everything was solved. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some of you will know of the course. Here we have Jesus Christ giving the roadmap back way to eternity, but at one point he said, um, Heaven must take the form of a choice. For you. But what's he mean? Heaven has to take the form of a choice. We're just talking about there is no choice. Why does heaven have to take the form of a choice? Because when the mind is caught up into the finite chaos, it doesn't know what oneness is. It has words like unity and connectedness, but it has forgotten. It has a major amnesia. It's such a major amnesia that there's not even a trace left of the oneness. It's like, it's like the word abstract, you know, if you went around the room, everybody could give you their feelings and their definitions of abstract, but, but no human being has experienced pure abstraction, because everything within the time-space cosmos is concrete and specific. We have separate people, separate places, separate things, separate objects, subject to object, you know, it's all separate. And so there's no feeling. When we think of abstract, sometimes people will say, well, I like, I, I like abstract art. So you go to the museum to see the abstract art, and it's less specific, but it still has colors and shapes, right? It doesn't, it's not shapeless and colorless. It still has form. It still has its contours. It's not abstract. It's called abstract art because compared to the detailed things of other art pieces, it seems much more unorganized, much more ephemeral, so forth. So really that's the key thing is is you have to realize that you could call it forgiveness, you could call it atonement, you could call it salvation like the Christians do or whatever. Whatever you do, that's going to come to a choice that's not like any of the rest. It's just an acceptance of who you are. It's not like a choice between images. You don't have to choose between his soulmates, that's, that would be a nasty kind of choice to have to make too, you know, where your soul feels so resonant with two. <laughs> then, oh, you know, that's where the guilt comes in in relationships, when someone seems to love one more than the other, you know, it just isn't that agape, unconditional love, it seems to be focalized and fixated on the object of all that love and affection, and it's, you know, it's just not it. It's just not it. Know thyself, the Greeks were on to the true soulmate. Mm -hmm. Your soulmate is yourself and God. <laughs> That's really the meaning of it.
And even when we talk about holy relationship, right away people think of in terms of partnerships. I want a holy partnership, but you know where it's heading. It's heading much higher than that. It's just like a step. <laughs> yeah, this is the kind of laughter that is so far transcends any 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 outcome in the world. Some of you know Lisa. She had her quantum awakening page was exploding and exploding and exploding, growing at exponential rates. And, and so then she thought, I'll, I'll have a, a retreat at Kalani and I'll invite David and I'll go the drumming and we'll, oh, it's going to be eclectic. And, uh, you know, this, this. and then, <laughs> so she said, well, well, we'll just wait for Friday to finalize it all. Comes today, Friday morning. Her quantum awakening page was hacked <laughs> and stolen. Oh, no. The whole she can't even get into it. <laughs> she was planning a, a big retreat, had 102 people that wanted to come. Somebody had already paid the full amount, and and an Arabic name from Kosovo <laughs> uh, took the page. And when she tried to get in there quickly. Change passwords, you know, get back in there. Boom. She was banned from the group. <laughs> and nobody locked out. And she was laughing just as hard as you're laughing. Now that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Beyond the concept, she went, oh well. <laughs> but, you know, if you can laugh when something that you've been working on for the last, how many years? Four? Yeah, four years. Pouring your heart into something for four years, just joyfully, and then it's just going like the Zen break. <laughs> just comes through like that. When you can laugh at it, then you know that your kingdom of heaven is, is right there. You know, you're right at the, at the getting to the pearly gates because that's, you know, we have to remember to laugh. We have to remember that we're not creatures of time and space. Our happiness, our joy, our love is not circumstance dependent. As Marianne would say, it's not circumstance dependent. When we can come fully into that experience, then it's really fun. Then we can really have a good laugh at the world. With whatever it seems to present to us, we can laugh. That's my wish for everyone, just to be able to have a good belly laugh when things seem to fall apart. Because remember, it's finite chaos. What, the, what were we thinking? I mean, I get so many calls, I've been doing this for like 25 years, and I get so many crisis calls, calls of desperation when they come in, and they'll say, these have been people that are on the spiritual path for a lot of years, and they really are hitting, hitting the wall, and they're saying, I can't keep it together. I, I don't think I can keep it together. Anymore, and I'm always like, great, great. <laughs> I'm so glad you reached that point. <laughs> if you want to keep it together, then go talk to the psychologist, the psychiatrists, you know, the parents, and da 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 da. But you're calling me, you say, yeah. <laughs> hooray, hooray, because it's it's only the belief that if we don't personally work so hard to keep this little coordinate in time and space. It's, it's a coordinate in time and space, it's like a molecule. Why, why would you try to keep that together? <laughs> if you can start to see the silliness and all the work and time and energy. I was in college for 10 years trying to improve my coordinate. So I went through self-help, I read lots of books, I took a lot of workshops, I did a lot of things trying to improve my coordinate. The coordinate is still the coordinate, it doesn't, you can put a lot of time, energy, money, focus and everything into it, it's still a coordinate in what? In finite chaos. Oh boy, that's great. 
<laughs> and then, then you can allow yourself to truly live, to truly follow your inspiration, not the shoulds and ought tos and have tos of society in the past. You better do this, or else you'll die. If you don't have three degrees and and this job and a second job and a good backup there, and if you don't have a house and car and all these things, then you're going to die. Well, that's you know you're already playing the game of a coordinate, and there's not much at all. If you listen to me, I don't have a lot of positive things to say about the coordinate because it's it's it's. I even went into a store recently. It's, it's a new Apple store that I saw, and it's called Eye Trouble. It's a little <laughs> mini eye, a little mini eye, and capital T, trouble. So if you've got trouble with your eye, dip iPods, iPhones, iPads, yeah, then you go in there. But I thought, that's the key to this whole thing. That's what the coordinate is. It's eye trouble. You've, you've misidentified your vast, glorious spiritual self with a little person personality self, and then you've got eye trouble. And you have to go and pay to have these little gadgets that are part of the little eye fixed. You think you can't function without these gadgets. That, that's pretty strong, and the, the coordinate needs little gadgets to survive now. You know, it's, it's really convinced itself. When its technology breaks down and says, like, ooh, 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 you know. But it, it really gets to be funnier and funnier and funnier when you, when you get back to the big picture of the whole thing and you say, wait a minute, I'm going to be intuitive. I'm going to follow my joy, my happiness. I'm not going to keep following these programs that are running through my mind, telling me you should, ought to, have to, you better do this, not enough of this, you can't be too secure, you always have to have backup plans, insurance, that's another hilarious one. The coordinate is, believes it and things around its coordinates have to be insured for the future. I wasn't looking for it. <laughs> You're dropping me out. Anna, Julie, oh! Yeah. But that's the playfulness of it. Yeah. But you're unwinding from it. Mm. You're not going to lose any sleep over it. You weren't even expecting it. <laughs> this picture that you're painting, it, it makes me think that, that our coordinate is like a Christmas tree that we dress up and, you know, we do all this stuff. And the way you say it just makes it so ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah, yeah in, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, look at all the trinkets made to hang upon the body to make lovely what you hate. And the reason the, the sleeping mind hates the body is because it's not a good enough home. It's not heaven. It falls a little bit short of eternity. And then it's hated because it's like, come on, you should be a better home. You should be a better coordinate, you know, you should offer me more. But it's like putting tinsel and hanging on the ornaments and then the bright lights and a star on top even, you know. Star, Marilyn Monroe, you know, star, you know, the fame, a star on the top to even make it more significant. And these are like, it's crazy, famous coordinates. That's, that's what a famous person is, the famous time-space coordinates in finite chaos. <laughs> Do you really want to be George Clooney? Do you really want to, you know, be these characters that people are emulate, you know, try to go to go to Hollywood and emulate and become a star? That's that's really what you're trying to be. That's a lot of work for nothing. So it's good. And I was thinking about Hawaii too, because I love the metaphor of Hawaii. Like I was thinking about lava. Now, when the lava comes, and it seems to come over history. There's not many factors and forces that the lava is, is you know, going to kowtow to. When the lava comes, it comes and it goes where it's going to go. 
you know, it flows. It just absolutely flows. It's going. You can't like get in front of it. You could put a bulldozer. You could try. <laughs> but this is hot stuff, and that lava's going to go where it's going to go. I was thinking about the jungle here too on this island. It pretty much goes where it wants to go. If you build a yard or like with Kalani, you know, you've got to really work <laughs> because the jungle is. It keeps coming. You know, you've got to really chop and cut and chop and cut and do a lot of chopping and cutting for a lot of years <laughs> because the jungle is like it's it's going to go where it's going to go and it keeps expanding and and I feel like that's like love and life. It's just going to you don't you can't really get in the way of it. You can only realize the futility of trying to block it out or the futility of trying to stop it. That's why we like love stories because our heart swells. We feel this burst of joy when we see a love story. It reminds us, it reflects the love that we have. So that's the same thing. Why would you, if the coordinate in time and space of the personality self isn't really who you are, and the love and light before time, prior to time, the I amness that Jesus talked about is who you are, why would you try to fight against that love? And why would you try to protect that coordinate? You see how much time and energy goes into protecting and defending the coordinate. Psychological defenses, insurances, all kinds of things. A lot of energy goes on to protecting this coordinate. So that's all I would say is, I just realized at some point in my life, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to waste precious moments on what Shakespeare called much ado about nothing. Why would I put so much work and effort into the much ado about nothing? And that's where you make the turn. That's where you really turn back toward the love, when you just say, I am not going to do this work on behalf of nothing anymore. I, I have a purpose, I have a calling, I have a function that brings me joy, and I want to get in that, and just let it take over my life, you know? Pull the strings. If this is a puppet, then you pull the strings, Spirit. And, it, it, and I just found it actually works. That's, that's what I got into. I mean, it's one thing to read these metaphysics, but if you don't apply it, if you don't really go for it in your life, then it's just another theology. You know, you've got a, now you've got a non-dual theology. But that doesn't even get you anywhere. You, know, you can talk fancy words and then you still don't feel it. So, I just feel like that's what we're here. We're calling everybody to jump in with us. We're not crazy. We're sane. <laughs> Happy and sane. Never take the piano music in. Do important things. <laughs> An example for me of what you're talking about is um, the difference uh, in my mind of, you know, having like a healthy salad. Or here, where we a lot of times eat macaroni and cheese. You know, it's <laughs> like the healthy salad is, is the tinsel on the Christmas tree. And the mac and cheese is like just getting through till the next time you need to put something in the body to keep it going, and without, without the whole, how it has to be this, you know, super duper thing to continue my coordinate or make my coordinate healthier, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Great. That's great. It's great. Lisa brought over a big thing of yeah. macaroni and cheese today, <laughs> so I had a bowl of that, and then, some cheese on it, and then, a, and then she baked a cake, so that, that was lunch. Macaroni and cheese and cake. <laughs> that makes me think of when before you said, I have to do this and this or I'm going to die. You're going to die. Anyway. I mean, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it will, the body will seem to come to an end, but um, I think that was what the point of the movie was, that, that uh, Nemo just 
he could see that all the memories, because he had, he had some pretty gruesome memories, so to speak, in there, going off and in a car off of, off into the water and, and drowning. In fact, that's the opening scene of the movie, you know, to, to lead into the movie. You know, the very first frame, you see Nemo's corpse. You see these eyes wide open, and it's just a dead, kind of white-skinned face. Uh, that's the first frame of the movie. You know, you're okay. You can start off with, start off with death. Instead of this eventual kind of thing, that was like the first frame of the movie. And then there was romance, there was relationship, there was children, there was all kinds of, of Nemo at different ages. And it was, a, it was a collage of memories. But it started off with this white corpse with these big eyes just staring blankly and and I think that's what you want to do is you want to come into an experience where you see that birth and death are both part of the finite chaos and that there has to come a point where we see that we never were born and we will never die you know in a truly a true experience of that not kind of hoping that we kind of get somewhere someday in fact in this movie, uh, there was like a reporter that came to interview Nemo when he was 118 years old, and he said to, to Nemo, do you believe in the afterlife? And only Nemo just burst into laughter. There was absolutely no word. I mean, he's going through this quantum experience, like, afterlife? <laughs> What's this before and after stuff like? You know, it's just so rich and full of so many memories. It's very much like quantum. Quantum physics, you know, overturned, it, it transcended Newtonian physics, which is the linear time space, and it just showed, like, superposition that, that we really, there's no such thing as matter, it's all potential, it's all just energy, it's all just potential, and then what you perceive as, like, a, a man talking, or a woman, or a room full of people, or whatever, is is a projection of a belief system. You have to believe in all these images for them to appear as if they're really there. So it's just like a quantum, it's like a flash of a tiny strip of memory out of all the potential memories, and this one looks like, like a room full of people. It's very tiny. It's just like that little coordinate again. It, everything about the coordinate, including its use of memory, is very small and tiny. So. It's great when you have these vast experiences because, you know, it's this deep feeling like I was never born and I will never die. Think how freeing that is because then when the pro old program comes in, you better do this or you'll die, you just laugh. Ah, we'll put you in charge. <laughs> you, you're, you're not threatened by that. Or people will tell me, oh, I, I have to get enlightened in this lifetime because I don't want to come back in the next one. That's a lot of pressure. Because it's still putting it on this lifetime. I'm going to do workshops and meditate. And get free the you know, it's a lot of work, but it's fear-based. Trying to do all that to avoid an outcome of of reincarnating in the next life. So we're talking about getting a wash of the mind, and even eventually the holy instant will will supersede or transcend reincarnation. You'll start to see, oh my god, that was just another belief system too. And then, you know, then you go deeper and deeper into that experience. What was the name of the movie? It was called Mr. Nobody. And I just saw it in, when I was in L.A., L LAX, right when I landed in LAX, there was a, a shooter um, mm -hmm. shooting uh, an assault rifle right next, in the terminal, right next to the one I was walking to. <laughs> and so I, I spent a lot of time in LA. Really, it was a call for love. One of my dear friends in LA so, was going through a meltdown. She was, she was wanting to let go of the coordinate, the personality self, and I don't want to be here anymore. She was going through a meltdown. So. It ended up, all this stuff happened in L.A. so I could spend basically a day with her <laughs> before I hopped on the plane to Hawaii. But yeah, that, that was, and then she showed me the film. And then I 
then Jason said, we have it on our hard drive. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, that, that will probably just keep coming here. What is it? Monday nights mm -hmm. is movie night. Just keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. What? are showing Mr. Nobody? <laughs> you know, you know what that is. It's not movie yeah. night, it's community night. Community it's, night. It's, it's Do you have a movie night? Uh, Often every other Friday. Every other Friday. Yeah, but there's nothing for the next month. But tomorrow it's a movie day. It's a good session. Maybe it's too hmm. What's happening here? Uh, yeah, from 10 to 6. Oh, during the day. Yeah. 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 Just bring your lunch if you come for the day with the wooden popcorn. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. And if they want to come to a movie retreat, there's going to be one coming up in December in Honolulu mm -hmm. that Jason and I know are going yeah. over to Honolulu to do a movie retreat. And there, look at that for quantum timing. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we just grab one on the way out. So we call it our Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment. We even have an online Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment that takes a lot of the emotions and things that you go through on planet Earth and then it coordinates them with movies and lessons and undoing belief patterns mm. in the mind. So that's why we call Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment, because people enjoy watching movies and they would like to be waking up to reality while they're watching the movie, instead of just being entertained. It's a bonus mm -hmm. <laughs> when you can interject it with a lot of purpose, you know, real deep purpose, and that makes it even yeah. More helpful. Yeah. I'm sure Mr. Nobody will find its way. <laughs> <laughs> People listen to our speakers and they, they go out, rent the movie. Oh, gosh, that was good. I, that's the little signs we talked about. That's the clue. They hear it on the internet, and they go out and rent it. And, yeah. Here, most important, David. Um, I, I want to know more about um, special love relationships. Um, this house has heard me say this word a lot since I've been here, but potent. Why is it so potent? And why is there nine chapters of, of it in the chorus? It just it seems like such a tough one. I don't, I don't understand why. Well, the, the divine metaphysics help give a little bit of a context um, where you start to see that uh, the addiction to this, I'm calling it this finite chaos, is the attraction to death. There's an attraction to death for the mind that's asleep. It's now become attracted to death because it's so afraid of waking up. It's mm -hmm. so afraid of the glory, it's so afraid of the grace, mm -hmm. it's afraid of the power that it will look for a substitute in the cosmos and anything that would seem to serve as a substitute is really an idol. You know, like in the Bible it says, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. We thought it was like golden calves and stuff like that, and totem poles. Things. It was talking about anything that we value in time and space more than oneness, more than love, more than God, we've made an idol. We see, we try to find the love in the form, but God didn't create the form. God didn't create this finite chaos. God is way beyond it. So that's why there's those nine chapters, because there's an addiction to linear time, there's an attraction to death, and there's 
therefore an attraction to anything that the ego made up to take the place of divine love. So, what we would say is romantic and interpersonal love and finding love in relationships and everything, it's like the old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places, <laughs> looking for love in too many faces. Couldn't be any wiser. The country singer's been singing about it all along. Yay! The, the wisdom award for best country performer. <laughs> yeah. And so, when you go for the love in the form, you end up with an achy, breaky heart. <laughs> but when you start to say, no, no, there's nothing inherently wrong about any of this form, it's just mirroring and reflecting back what's going on in my consciousness that has to be healed. Mm -hmm. So if I project control issues onto my partner, I've got control issues in my mind that I have to work on. If I pr project fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, you know, all kinds of guilt and shame around anything, then those are just still issues that are still up for healing. And so they're actually doing a great favor by reflecting it back. They're actually mm -hmm. showing a closer look at the mind, because it's such intense mirroring. Now that's giving it over and seeing it from a positive way, but again, the ego's goal is a substitute for love. It wants to make its own version of love that's so enticing, so alluring, so tempting, that you get lost in the goal for the form and you forget about the goal of love within, like within your heart. So it, it, it very easily slips over into codependency. <clears throat> you know, out of seven billion people, you, you get involved in one of these relationships and you notice that you're very concerned about their behavior. <laughs> For the rest of the seven billion, it's not bad. <laughs> they can do what they want. You're indifferent. Actually indifferent. But, for the one that you're like partnered up with, then the behavior becomes important. You see, and then the control comes out, and then all the fears that are have been kept down out of awareness start to come up and out, because the God substitute is not going to live up to that, and then the ego is going to blame. So you said forever, you promised, you promised, we agreed upon, da 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 da. da. It's it's always going to fall short because the goal for the setup and the pursuing of the relationship was was egoic. It wasn't wasn't of God. So in that sense, you know, it's like that song "Love the One You're With." Um, it's it's more you're trying to really have an appreciation and a gratitude and cultivate that real deep sense of love with everything and everyone that comes your way. But it's very different from trying to make it into the box of the romantic. You know, Anna and Julie coming in there, but it was, you just accepted it. And, and they helped you out in that way, but it wasn't like you went in with a goal for Anna or Julie. It was like they were more like angels. They come in, they offer a blessing and they go their way. And, and what's wrong with that? Well, to the ego, there's no continuity in that. The ego would say, well, now if Andy had married Anna or Julie, then we're talking a little bit of substance, continuity, <laughs> in time. Remember, in the, in the chaos, in the finite chaos, that's what goes for... <laughs> yeah, we were talking the other day, we were laughing about, you know, Silver anniversary, 25. <laughs> Gold anniversary, 50. <laughs> and is it, what is it, platinum? Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Just the very thought of 75 years of marriage equates with dead for Joe. <laughs> but you see, diamond, diamond. I've got to get these metaphors right. <laughs> Diamond, that's much better than platinum. That's more like an American Express card or something. <laughs> These silver, gold, 
But really, you see, the ego is saying the continuity is in linear time. So the more, the longer the relationship, the better. That's why people cheer those long marriages because they go, well, you hung in there for such a long time. Nobody asks the quality of the relationship. You, know, you might have been fighting and bickering for 50 years. <laughs> you know, and, and what's good about that? But, but it's the longevity is continuity, and the ego looks for continuity in linear time. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's trying to get the right form and make sure the form lasts as long as it can. And you get more brownie points in heaven. Somehow <laughs> you're going to get through the gates that you've done long, more time with one person. It doesn't really work that way. If the continuity is in the purpose. When you're following your intuition, your joy, your happiness, and let the form just be given, be what it is, then you're right on. You know, that's, that's how you zoom right into the kingdom of heaven, within. But you see, those are two different definitions of continuity. One looks for it in linear time, which God did not create, and then one looks for it in forgiveness, which is staying present, not getting into the grievances and the worry, just staying totally present. So, I mean, that, that made all the difference for me, and, and I, I was glad I had a pretty good intuitive sense of that when I started on this journey, because then the Spirit called me to go to all these, you know, whatever, 31 countries, and 49 states and all this travel, and I had different travel companions, different translators in different countries. I had many different characters that showed up to help me fulfill my glorious, happy function. But I wasn't attached to them. I wasn't like, oh, thank you for that travel partner, don't ever take them away. It was more, thank you for that translator, but don't ever take them away. You know, it was more, thank you. And wow, didn't that go wonderful with such a collaborative effort, and okay, I'm open to whatever. When you stay, you can stay that open and that focused on your purpose, then that's where the joy comes in. You don't have to be trying to become dependent on the form, because as soon as you become dependent on the form, then the fear of loss comes in. Something could be taken away from you. We talked about that loss of... Loss of a partner, you know, that's where the, the fear comes in. It's really fear of love, but it's, it takes the form of fear of loss. Is it, is it like the, the pain that I feel from, say, a special relationship is like the love I'm kind of withholding or not extending? Can you say that? Yeah, because you, you, you can't be, show me what I'm not. Yeah, you can't be invested in both. So, yeah, it's like, it's, it's like misinvesting, and, and the more you come into purpose, the more you, you start to see that you're, you're giving and you're receiving from that purpose, and it's, it's glorious. But it's, it's more of, yeah, it's just, it's still trying to pump life into a failing idol, you know, and that's why when people say, oh, my life is falling apart, my life is falling apart, I say, that's good, let it. You, you're... Fragmented perception has to fall apart. The the container has to crack for the new the, the spirit to pour through. Like Jesus said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. You can't find happiness, peace, love, and joy in fragmented perception. Literally, perception has to be reordered and expanded. You know, for years we've been hearing about it, expand your consciousness. That's what they talked about in the sixties, even. Let's expand our consciousness. That's what, that's good. That was right on, man. Just keep expanding your consciousness and you'll really get happy. But it doesn't mean that, that there's certain forms that you have to aim for and have goals for. That just still freezes it into boxes, you know. People say, this is what a good marriage looks like. I think it could be easier to say, this is what a good marriage feels like. Because you feel freedom, you feel joy, you feel happiness. But looks, it's not meant, we're not meant to uh, freeze it down into the form. I'm, I'm opening to quantum relationships. I mean, the more I get into quantum physics, I'm like, I like that. 
<laughs> like that expansive feeling of feeling, you know, in love with everyone, and then when whoever you're with is going to feel that big-heartedness. Like, like watching that movie today and hearing his last words, and, and hearing, seeing Anna, Anna, and then opening up the card from Anna, and then having a big, like a, a hug through a card. <laughs> But that was a nice experience for me, but, but it's very different than trying to hold on to form. We've had in our communities, we've had very, very guided marriages and, and guided divorces. And there's a joy in both, because you're following the guidance. You see how in the world there's this stigma. You know, we celebrate birth, we mourn death, we celebrate marriage, we, we mourn divorce, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the forms. If we follow our heart, we follow our guidance, and expanding our consciousness, that's where the joy comes in, in expanding our consciousness, not being so locked in. But you see how different that is from the world's ways, you know. Oh, you say the word divorce, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm here. It is so to be terrible. But, you know. Maybe as a minister there, but let me perform divorces or something. Our divorce um, minister today will be. I'm returning now to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I always like humor that shows the quantum that everything is is perfectly in divine order. Like there, Steve Martin, so funny, made the, his movie L.A. Story, and it shows an ATM. It's got all the people lined up with their cards to access the ATM, and all the robbers lined up with their guns. <laughs> so the guy goes to the APN and it takes out, you see the money come out, and then one of the robbers steps forth with the guns. That'll be your robber tonight in the exchange. Very pleasant. He's making fun of how laid back and pleasant LA is. I'll be your robber tonight. <laughs> then the next one gets the money. I'll be your robber tonight. And this just goes on. That's Steve Martin humor. But you see, that's quantum. It's like... You know, he's poking fun. He's actually hinting that you can be laid back <laughs> and seem to get robbed. <laughs> but and it, it happens so much too. He's poking fun too at the frequency. But. <laughs> yeah, you don't choose. You don't even choose to love your face. Yeah. Yeah. It's a given. Yeah, it's all given. Mm. Okay, thank you so much everyone for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you.